go. We are in a uh, tribunal of uh, Compiègne, and after hearing the uh, witness, uh, the judge uh, renders his uh, sentence, not a sentence, but his judgment. It was a sentence actually for us. So the judgment, uh, he says, the uh, Le uh, Petru uh, Rochelle and Leon Malmed are now under the guard of Charles and Sarah Bloom. And we are devastated. Papa and Mama Riboulot are devastated. We just don't know what's happening. It's uh, been taken away, first from our parents, then from our second parents, and being forced to go and live with people we don't know is horrible. And we have to leave now immediately. So we go back, we all go back to the house, and we pack whatever we can, and we are now uh, driving in their van to Saint-Quentin. So we come to this house, a very, very small house, where they have two daughters and another cousin whose parents also have died in deportation, and the two of us. So we are now in that home, very small home, five children. There's not enough bed, so I am actually uh, I now forced to go and sleep in a bed that is very, very narrow in a closet uh, with my uh, cousin, Salomon. Uh, to, for us, start another new life full of dread and full of uh, anger. For and not knowing. And not, not knowing. knowing, exactly. So I absolutely decided I will never talk to these people, and I never do, <laughs> very rarely, just uh, when it's absolutely necessary. So I start going to school, uh, and uh, my sister Rochelle is actually does much better than I do. She's, I think, smarter than I am, and she says, well, we are here. Uh, so language, was language is no, no, well, no problem. They mostly speak in uh, Yiddish at home, and of course, when we don't want, they, they do not want us to understand, they speak in Polish. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they work uh, on the open market, so they leave very early and they come back uh, about uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a very hard life uh, for them. It's a very hard life for all of us. And they really do not know, but they show no affection for us at all. It's, uh, you know, we are there, they feel it's probably their uh, Devoir, as we say in French, uh, they have to do it because of our parents, it's family, but there is no affection in the family. And, uh, obligation. Yeah, uh, it's an obligation, yeah. yes, more of an obligation. Within a year, uh, my uncle goes uh, to America to see his sister, and he comes back and he says that Rochelle is going to be leaving for America. So my sister doesn't want to go without me. She says, I'm not going. And I said, I don't want my sister to leave because, uh, but one thing after the other, my sister leaves for America within about uh, a year. So two years after being there, she is forced to board the Queen Mary and leave America. I was supposed to follow within a few months and for a number of reasons that it doesn't happen. My aunt who lives in Brooklyn doesn't have the room, doesn't have the money to guarantee that I will not be at the charge of the US government, whatever, it doesn't happen. So uh, I give up really on coming to America and within a year uh, a year or two, I cannot take it anymore. As soon as she leaves, uh, that uh, they didn't want me to go to to uh, to school, 
beyond the uh, first uh, stage. And uh, my sister actually had gotten some money from Papa and Mama Riboulot and she had paid for my schooling, which was the uh, senior high school. And uh, I continued to go there, but when she leaves, I really, uh, everything falls apart for me. And that's when I'm 14, I'm about 13 actually, and I start to smoke. And, uh, oh. <laughs> we talked about uh, smoking. Yeah, smoking yeah. yeah, right. I used to buy this uh, pack of five cigarettes called Craven, <laughs> Craven uh, English cigarettes, and I start to smoke and I start to really go with a bad company. I start to go and play football in bars and so on. I mean, just bad, bad, bad. This would be what year? That, that was uh, no. That was uh, in uh, already in uh, 1946. About 1949. Oh. Yeah, 1949. Oh. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this is going on now for a year. And I said I've got to get out. And I knew that uh, it was not me. I knew that I was not on the right track and so on. And I asked them again to go back to Compiègne with Papa and Maman Riboulot. And I said, no, you will not go uh, in a Goy's uh, home. So you know what Goy is? Yes, yeah, uh, okay. non-Jew. Non-Jew, yes. yes. No, 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 no. And I said to myself, oh, what can man. I do? So I got the idea of going and seeing the president of the Jewish organization of Saint-Quentin. His name is Mr. Zibberberg, a very, very nice person, very short, very, very nice person. And I only met him a number of, uh, a few times, but every time I met him, is that the, the way he, the few words that he, he the few questions and so on, uh, made me feel very comfortable with him. So I go and see him, and I explain my dilemma. And, uh, uh, oh, the last time I'd asked, uh, that was like a week before, uh, to go back to Compiègne, I said, no, and if you continue like this, we're going to put you in an orphanage. So uh, I said, well, no, I will just evade the orphanage. I will not stay in the orphanage. But it, it was a uh, genuine uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, sentence or thoughts or, or threats. So I... Uh, explain the situation of Mr. Zibberberg, and he says, I understand. I said, look, don't do anything. Because I told him that the alternative for me is just to, to just leave. I'm just going to leave. I'm not going to stay another year with this family. They hate me. I hate them. And we have been here almost four years, and I just cannot stay any longer. I want to go back to Compiègne. So, they, uh, so he says, don't do anything uh, foolish that I and will talk. He, he, I w was, he was aware that your sister was you oh, yeah. alone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Your sister yeah. Was oh, absolutely. No, we lived in a, in a community of about, uh, uh, Saint Quentin was about 30, 40,000 people, and the community maybe was 500 Jews or less, actually, yeah. a few hundred Jews. Everyone knew everything about uh, every family. So the, um, he says, I will talk to, uh, to our associate, to our organization, and uh, just give me one week. Sure enough, within one week, uh, my uh, uncle and aunt are asked uh, to attend a meeting, and they are being told, in not so, so many words, that the best thing to do is to let me go back to where I want. He said he's now almost 14. He knows what he wants. You have had four years. You have done what you needed to do for his parents. And uh, you know, we want to say thank you for them. Yeah. But he's very unhappy. And he's just going to end up as really as a bad person. So that's it. So they came back home, and they told me that you can leave. Thank goodness. Yeah. Oh. Now. Yeah. So the <laughs> next day, the next day I was on the train. Yeah. Okay. So I went back to Compiègne, 
And uh, by that time... Did they know you were coming back? Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah. They, oh, knew, I mean, they I, knew everything I, that was going no, on. I wrote, they knew you were unhappy. I, I wrote to them every week, yeah. I wow. wrote a letter to them every week, yes. Oh, Religiously, okay. every week. That was That's my to religion know. to write to them. So, the, um, so by that time, both of their sons actually had left home and they were married. And I had... Uh, uh, an excellent, I had uh, an excellent relationship with, uh, with them and we were like brothers and sisters, yes, with uh, both of them. Nice. Yeah, they were always very, very nice, very supportive. They were just absolutely wonderful, uh, wonderful people. Uh, the whole family was wonderful. It was not only the family that we lived, but it was the extended family. The, their sisters and brothers, their nephew and so on. We were, we were family, always. There was absolutely no difference whatsoever. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, yes, yes. We never felt that we were outsiders. We never felt that we were uh, people that they supported. Uh, that, yes. No like we did when we were in Saint-Quentin. So it was just a, a, a wonderful time. So I, uh, it was very hard at the beginning in Compiègne to go back actually to the routine of studying and so on. But I was very lucky. I you found were alone and you were 14 years old. Yes, right. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I was very lucky. I had one a professor of mathematics, and for some reason, uh, they, I don't know, he, he liked me or whatever, and he probably saw that I was not uh, completely idiotic, and he helped me on, you know, in uh, France, uh, you don't go to school on Thursdays, and, uh, but you go to school on Saturdays. So every Thursdays, he would give me private lessons at no cost whatsoever, Wow. He was just a, a wonderful uh, person. And uh, so I started to really understand. Was he helping you with math, mathematics or English or, no. I mean, uh, or uh, uh, French? What? what was, I'm sorry, what was your question? <laughs> what was he helping you with? Math, with mathematics. Yes, thought. yes. Okay. He happened to be the principal, actually, of the school, but he was also a professor of mathematics and I really had problems. And all of a sudden I started and eventually I became an engineer, but uh, it's because of him <laughs> who put me back on, uh, on track. So uh, from one thing to the other that uh, I, uh, I really made my way to, to education. Uh, so once I did actually pass the second degree of education, what am I going to do? So I was offered to take on some, some, uh, an, some other business in the open market and so on. And that was not attractive. So I decided to do, go to a vocational school where I learned to mechanical designs and so on. And uh, then I finished actually in a very short way that uh, usually took about three years and I did it in two years. So I started to work after that. And you spoke the, French at that time? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I spoke French from infancy because I was born oh. in French, yes. Okay. So I always spoke French. But Yiddish yes. also? Well, Yiddish also, especially I learned Yiddish in, uh, when I was in Saint-Quentin because that was the only language spoken in the yeah. house. Okay. Yes. But I made all efforts not to speak in Yiddish with them. So my spoken Yiddish was just because I was so angry at them. I'm not, going, I'm not going to give them any pleasure whatsoever, which was, again, not very smart on my part, but that's the way I felt at the time. And uh, we, uh, so I, I understood Yiddish. I still understand Yiddish, although I haven't really spoken I uh, heard Yiddish practically for 60, 65 years. So uh, it was quite, uh, quite in or 60, yeah, 60 years. That was quite interesting uh, life. 
So by that time that uh, my sister and I corresponded actually uh, by letters, no telephone. We never spoke on the telephone. Telephone was very expensive and uh, we had no telephone at home. The only time you could telephone, you had to go to the post office, ask for a certain number and they directed you to a cabin and so on. So we never did. But we wrote to each other every about once a month approximately. <coughs> and I learned that she got married. In fact, she got, uh, she contracted, she got married and then a year later she had tuberculosis so in New York and she had to be away from home for a year, an entire year. And she already had actually a, uh, a child, uh, by the way, two years after we were married. So it was a very difficult time for both her husband and, uh, and her. And uh, fortunately she survived that and she uh, so she, she was there 13 years later. Oh, in the meantime, I did get, uh, so I finished uh, schools and uh, engineering school and so on, but I did it actually as I worked and I was married. I uh, was married in 1961 with my uh, first wife. And my sister came in, uh, I think it was in 1963. Yes, in 1963. We hadn't seen each other for 13 years. Yeah. We had not spoken to each other in 13 years. I mean, we had written to each other. Say. So it was really a very emotional oh. reunion. And she came back. And she came back, yeah. yes. So we, I had taken a month uh, of vacation. Uh, so we went all over France for maybe three weeks, uh, all over France with her, visiting family. And it was the first time I returned to see actually my uncle and aunt. Oh. And I still held a grudge against them. <laughs> I don't do them and for a long time now, I don't. Because I understand why they did this. And uh, so, but uh, I was just, I held a grudge for a long time to have separated us from the people we loved. Turns out that you know, things worked out very well for everyone and uh, probably was a good, a good uh, might not be here talking to you today if we had never gone to Saint-Quentin in the first place. So it's wow. interesting how life uh, uh, develops. So In hindsight. In hindsight, yes. So I, yeah. so I returned to, to, to Compiègne. So we were, I was married, I had one child. And my brother-in-law, who is a real entrepreneur, that convinced us, my wife, myself, that we really should come to America. We do it for my sister and uh, do it for ourselves. So I was working at the time for Michelin in Clermont-Ferrand, Michelin, the tire manufacturer. And I didn't care too much for that position because Michelin was a very large company and it was kind of a a prison when you were inside. They were so concerned about security and so on. And uh, I just could not see myself staying in a company waiting for the next vacation, for the next raise. I just wanted to do things. And I felt that I needed to, to start companies. I needed to do, to contribute to the world and not to be just a, an individual contributor of uh, just a little bit to do this and wait for retirement. I, yeah never thought about retirement. I was not ready for that. So we decided, and my wife was already pregnant actually for the, with a the second child, and we decided to leave. So we were very comfortable. I was uh, in an engineer position. I had a car. I had a new car. I had a beautiful apartment with wow. new furniture and so on. It was a very difficult decision, but a good decision. So we emigrated. We came with the SS France on his second voyage across the Atlantic in February. It was a horrible crossing because we, uh, we went through two uh, tornadoes or hurricane or whatever, wow. it was, wow. but we made it. The first year in this country, so I came with about $500 in my pocket. And, uh, Where did you land in America? We landed in New York and in New York, and we lived uh, with my sister for about a month until we found an apartment. So we moved into Queens. With into With no, well, my wife was still pregnant yeah, at the with time. one child. One child, yes. So we moved into a garden apartment in uh, Queens. 
And uh, we, I worked actually for my brother-in-law at the, at the time. So it was very difficult. It was so many, and if I had, had only had $500, which really saved us, because if I had more money, I would have, we would have gone back. That uh, it was, uh, no. It was disappointing. It was very disappointing. Wow. Yes. So many changes, so many things. My wife didn't speak a word of English. My English, I had seven years of English in school, but it was really uh, kind of very raw. Uh, it was, everything was difficult, everything was difficult. So, uh, we uh, came from a beautiful, clean, new apartment to an, an old apartment full with roaches <laughs> we couldn't get rid of. <laughs> with a car that, uh, that the battery I had to bring up every night because it would freeze and I couldn't start the car in the morning, uh, so on and so forth. So. Uh, and after a year, we decided to go back for a trip and decide if we wanted to leave, actually, we'd saved enough money to do that, in America or France. And we came back to France, and we definitely decided to go back to America and make our life there. So, you know, things, somehow, we didn't see things the same, the same way anymore. So, uh, I lived and uh, we progressed in my job that I changed uh, jobs uh, a couple of times and uh, things uh, started to, to go uh, very well. You know, I found out that in France, actually, not that I want to say anything about uh, American behavior, but we find that people are all spoiled here, were spoiled here. So uh, to me, that working 12 hours, it was no problem whatsoever for as long as, as I see that I was progressing and so on. You know, I didn't think about retirement, I didn't think about vacation. I just wanted to achieve something. I wanted to, I wanted to be, our company to be the best at, at everything. So of course, that when you have such an attitude, you progress very quickly in, in uh, companies. So at the age of uh, 28, uh, with uh, my uh, heavily accented, uh, heavily accented English. Uh, I was made actually general manager of the company that uh, I worked for, and that was an experience and a half, and that that uh, went uh, quite well. The problem in uh, working such long hours and and uh, working six days a week just put me in trouble with my wife and uh, she decided actually to ask for a divorce. So I was able to postpone that uh, horrible decision of hers for a year, uh, but uh, eventually she did come back and ask actually for a divorce and I had no choice but uh, uh, leave the home. And to me, divorce was uh, was an impossibility. Um, I had lived with my wife and my children. I just couldn't see being away from her and from my children. But uh, that was the way it was. So for three years, I was a, uh, I was a single, and it was a very difficult time. And I had swore at the time that I would never get married again. That was my, uh, my decision. Uh, but when I met Patricia, I guess she made me change my mind on that uh, issue. So, no, I, I really felt that so when you got somehow. So, it was uh, uh, after two children. You had two two children. children, yes, two children. And what happened after the divorce with the children? Well, I uh, took an apartment, actually, it was a uh, furnished apartment, uh, a. Uh, and I left everything in the house. I didn't want to disturb my children at all. So I left the house. I left my wife with everything else. And so I just had my car. And I lived in a, uh, in a furnished apartment. And very close so that uh, they would come and spend all weekends with me. Okay. Yeah. And uh, vacation time and, and so on. So uh, I really felt that something was wrong here. I had lost my parents. I had lost my second parents. I, uh, I was put with people who I didn't like. Uh, then I moved to America and I lost my wife again. I said, wow, no, so many things happening. But things changed when I met Patricia. My children got along very well with her. Where did her. you meet her? Well, I met her in, on Long Island. Uh, the, I had 
met this uh, doctor pediatrician on Long Island. He was taking care of our children and he happened to, uh, to uh, be French. And he also, after the war, uh, his parents had moved uh, to Venezuela so for a number of years and he became actually a doctor in France and he was a doctor in Venezuela and he was uh, he spoke uh, Spanish as well and my wife was a nurse at a hospital in the pediatric uh, department and so he would come to the hospital whenever he had actually his uh, uh, children patient there which was almost every day or several times a week and uh, he was able to speak Spanish with her because my wife actually was born Patricia was born in Colombia oh. and she moved uh, to the United States uh, very uh, at uh, the age of six so when he found out that she was also single after a divorce and uh, that uh, he says oh you've got to meet my friend so uh, he, reluctantly she gave him her telephone number and we talked uh, on the telephone and uh, you know, I'm not really a big uh, talker on the telephone but we talked for about an hour so yeah. there was wow. a connection there and uh, we had uh, made a date actually for two weeks down the road well in between there was a Saturday uh, where uh, the uh, Maurice had a son who was three and he had invited me to the wedding, to, not to the wedding, but to, to the birthday celebration. <clears throat> and the, uh, so there was a, a beautiful, I think it was a July uh, a day, a beautiful day and everyone, everyone was in the Everyone was in the backyard around the pool. Keep going. Please continue. It was in the backyard. And they were in the backyard around the pool, and somehow I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water because they only had soda, and I just tried to stay away from soda even then. And there was no one in the kitchen, and the, uh, the doorbell rang. So I looked around, there's no one there, so I go and open the, the door. And here is this absolutely beautiful, beautiful uh, person out there holding a uh, three-year-old uh, child, a uh, boy. And uh, she is dressed in white with white stockings and white shoes and a white coif and so on, white uh, smock, a blouse and so on. And I thought that she was the governess of a uh, kid uh, who was a family, uh, was, a, it's a, was in an affluent uh, area. So we look at each other and we don't say anything, some reason, you know, the, uh, and all of a sudden I hear a voice. And the voice says, it's her. Uh, uh, it didn't click at all, so her, her. Who can be her? You know, who is by the name of her? <laughs> so I turn around, and it is my friend uh, uh, Maurice, uh, Doctor Maurice Gonsberger, who tell me it's her, her. So say, Patricia, you talk to her. <laughs> she actually was not coming to the party, but her son had been invited to the party because they were about the same age as uh, his uh, yeah. son. So we talked a little bit, and I said, well, are you still on, actually, for that uh, date? Uh, for, so we said, yes. And uh, then we just met uh, uh, that, uh, on that Wednesday, which was after that uh, Saturday. That's how we met. Yeah, okay. There are more interesting things in the book that you will hopefully read soon. <laughs> okay. But you had mentioned, asked about uh, lifelong contact with the people that saved you. Ah, yeah, that is a very important issue. Yeah. Very contrary to that, uh, what the, the, our neighbor had predicted, that uh, the war would end and we would never see us again. Totally, totally different. That we 
uh, of course, I lived with them until I went into the Air Force. At the age of 20, I went to the Air Force for two and a half years. And, uh, but I was still, of course, you know, within uh, the household to speak of. Uh, so uh, after that, I did get uh, married, and we would see them several times a week. I moved actually to the center of France, and we would come back at least uh, once or twice a year. We moved to the States, and they were disappointed that uh, I moved away. There's no question about it at first. And they, they, they said, well, I hope that you are doing the right thing. So immediately after I, I moved to the state, I wrote to, to them. And I didn't get any response for, oh, at least two months, actually. But I kept writing. Every week, I wrote a letter. And we still, actually, the telephone was really not used in those days for international calls. And eventually, after about two months, I got a letter from uh, Papa Henri, and a very nice letter. And then, about every two or three weeks, we would correspond. And they were just uh, uh, amazing with the correspondence. <laughs> so I went back almost every year. And then, uh, as my uh, position in the industry uh, just was elevated, I was uh, responsible for international uh, business development, sales, marketing, and so on. So I went to see them about two or three times a year. And I always spent two or three days with them. We brought them, my sister and I brought them to the state twice. We also uh, had them, uh, we also brought them to Jerusalem, uh, to Yad Vashem, uh, so where they received the medal of the, the just, uh, wow. the, the righteous. Uh, just. So there was a ceremony in Paris at the um, Israeli consulate, and also a whole ceremony lasted like two days in Jerusalem at the Yad Vashem Museum. It was very, wow. very good. And I do have actually a video of it, which I will send to you a, right. a copy. So we stayed, we stayed with, uh, in, with them all our lives. We were there when they departed, and uh, two or three days before, uh, the doctors, I mean, the, the, their family, their grandchildren actually told me that well, things were not going. So we, we went there, Patricia and I went there several days, so we already saw them uh, giving their last breath, and we talked to them and so on. Wow. So we were there. Okay, same thing with the, uh, same thing with the, 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 uh, the sons. Yeah, we were there all the time. And to this day, that we are very much in touch with the, the, the grandchildren and the grand-grandchildren and the grand-grand-grandchildren, actually. Yeah. We have always been invited to every wedding that had happened. So the, the, we were there last year for a wedding of a grand, was it, a grand-grandchildren, or great-grandchildren, I guess it's called. And uh, we, uh, we're going back uh, in two weeks, and uh, we will be there again. I think that's yeah. wonderful. June ha might have a question. Or well, yeah, I, I did. Well, I was, so I mean, you can talk about it, but I want to I tell me a little bit about your biking. Bob, Go ahead. I, was, I think I was going to put a little snack out. Oh. So when? maybe Afterwards. We all, I mean, you were... Afterwards. We're almost, almost through. No, when he's finished. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I, I was curious about, did you have, I mean, growing up, you had such tension growing up as a very small child. And although you talked about some of it with the fear of the Germans and the Nazis, I just wondered, how, did that have some kind of a you lifelong... Come over here, stand, get over here so he can face the right Some way. kind of a lifelong effect on you, on your psyche? Of those early years of such, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what well, I believe it did, it does. In fact, uh, everyone has uh, some some kind of experience in life, and uh, that is going to change their uh, ways of thinking, of doing things, of talking to other people, and so on. In fact, when I uh, when I wrote the book uh, in French, uh, that. Uh, 
I started to write a book in English, and then I found this wonderful person who is a writer, is also a professor of literature in France, and uh, she agreed actually to uh, be my editor. Mm -hmm. And so the, the purpose of writing the book was just to talk about the war era. And she said in Orléans that it would be, people would be very interested in exactly what you say. What happened to you? How did it change you? What did it do to you? Because people will think that you should have become a delinquent. You should be in jail. You should be, become very angry at people. It should have really uh, made you a, a, a different person. Okay. Uh, hopefully it did not. Is that uh, uh, to this day uh, that I like to laugh, I like humor, and so on. So uh, the, when I give a presentation, a talk to schools, to church, to synagogue, to adults, whatever, they are almost more interested in what happens to me after the war and because of the war and because of the events and because of what I have gone through, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, so uh, then I continue to write and the book actually ends almost to, to this day. Uh, yeah. To this day, so did it change me? It changed me in a way. It changed me in a way, Julie. That uh, we we uh, to me the bad things. I, I try to see to see things with the degree of importance that, uh, and I see people complaining about this and this and this, and to me it is not important. You know, what is important? It is important is your wife, your spouse, your family, your children, uh, your health, and everything else is that can be taken care of, problems that can be dealt with, that are dealt with. There is a solution. There is no solution to, there's, many times there is solution to health, but there is no solution to death. And that's really well, that's what, great, what you attitude, have to... Attitude summary, I mean, of your... So it's a question of attitude, right. yes, okay. You can choose to be unhappy all your life, because there is always something that will make you unhappy, or you can choose to, to distinguish, be to, to be happy, right? Yeah. You can be happy, but in truth, you cannot be happy all your life that it is not human to be happy all the time uh, unless you fake it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, we come to an age where you don't fake things anymore, that you have to be truthful. I'm going to, I mean, that's a, a good, good summary. I'm going to put a few little things what? out here, a little oh, right. snack things. I think that was a okay. great way to uh, wind up. Uh, we're not, I just wanted to ask you one more thing. I know that this will be edited. Yes, and we'll pick I just need things. to go to the bathroom. Well, you got to go back. Okay, let's just start it off. Would you mind? Yes, uh, just okay. Ready. I would like to go back to one area that uh, question that's often asked is that did you ever feel anti-Semitism? When I was in uh, France in Compiègne, I cannot say I did. Uh, when I moved to Clermont-Ferrand, which was uh, which is located the in the center of France, so that I uh, was uh, I was working for a uh, tire company, Michelin, and I was in this uh, engineering office, and there was one fellow who somehow was a racist, uh, a very xenophobe, uh, anti-Semite to the nth uh, degree, and he, when no one was there, which just the two of us, he would all he would uh, take advantage of saying, would turn, he was in front of me and he would turn around, look at me and say, we have another one. We have another one. Can you imagine is that they are still alive? And he would just make this kind of a, a comment with that. Uh, and this was actually probably part of my decision to come to the US where I hoped that it would be a more open country with a lot of uh, diversity in the religious races and so on. And I was not disappointed, actually. When I came here, I cannot say that I've been here now for over 45 years. Never have I felt 
any sign of uh, racism towards me or anti-Semitism towards me. I, I just cannot say that I have. And it was a great, great relief. Well, that is so good to hear. Yeah. And I have heard that from yeah. many survivors. That yes. And I have lived in uh, three places in the States. I've lived in New York for 18 years. I've lived uh, uh, for about two years in Colorado. And I have lived uh, in, in uh, California since uh, 1982. When I came to California, that was the first time in my life that I felt I was home. <laughs> yeah, it was really the first time that I felt I was home. I, everything, and now it's been over 30 years, and I still feel the same way. That's wonderful. That I travel quite a bit. We still travel. I travel for business. I still travel for pleasure. And when I come home, I feel just it's my home. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Are you still a working man? No, no. I uh, retired actually from a high tech industry, the name of the company. I retired at Sandisk, a company that manufactures the flash uh, card. Oh. No, the, uh, yeah. So uh, 11 years ago. And uh, since then, I've been enjoying life to its best. That uh, my hobbies are uh, biking is my first hobby. I I love sailing. I love uh, golfing. But when I retired, I thought I would become a good golfer. I never did. So <laughs> still golf once in a while. But uh, I've taken on the biking. How did I get into biking? It's quite interesting. Uh, when we moved, uh, when we, when I retired, we decided to move into a golf community so I could golf about uh, three, four, five times a week. And that uh, became uh, too much, actually. It became really too much. Uh, so I, uh, uh, I, know, I, I didn't say I have to find something else, but a friend of mine who I was golfing with was uh, in biking and he says oh you've got to come and bike with us but you know i could see this all these guys dressed up in biking shorts and yeah. so on i was really intimidated <laughs> so finally he convinced me and uh, i cleaned up a, an old uh, steel bike that i had in my garage and one day i decided to join them well i couldn't go up uh, a, a high speed bump so <laughs> so uh, they lent me actually a, a newer bicycle and I started to get into it and uh, I think I became better than all of them and today that I, uh, I do bike quite a bit. Uh, at, at the time I biked like 5,000 miles a year. Okay. So wow. I, I participated in, in events of one week biking. I did the death ride three times which is 125 miles and 16,000 feet a set. And uh, I really, uh, so it's taken me to New Zealand, to uh, wow. Italy, to, to many countries actually, oh uh, to Aust Australia. Uh, so that is, and so, yeah, so I do play some golf, not too often. I do biking or about three, three times a week. And I sail in the summertime. Uh. We hike and uh, I ski. So, oh in fact, we'll be skiing. Uh, in three weeks in in France in the Alps because uh, there is no that snow is, here. That is yeah. terrific. Yeah, yeah. That is terrific. Must so be hopefully terrific. it will last until I break something. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I, if you have any uh, little comments to uh, end this little interview, any 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 other thoughts? You know, I have interviewed some survivors that uh, talked about God. And they said, because God turned his face the other way and did not help the Jews, uh, that they don't believe in God anymore. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. The, when I lived with my parents, my, my, my parents, that uh, I was too young, and they were not really religious people, as far as I understand. When I lived with a Christian family, uh, they were Christian and they had a crucifix on top of their bed, but never they prayed, never they, they went to church. They were, they were religion by tradition. You know, we are all born, very few of us will change religion. Is that you are born in a 
Catholic family or in a Jewish family, and that's what you are. Uh, and so it's not a choice, really. It's a tradition in the family. And you can do whatever you want. But you know, some people will change, will become evangelical, and it's fine. Uh, so I never was exposed to any religion. When I lived in Saint-Quentin, they did not go to shul, they did not go to synagogue, the same thing. So I was never exposed. I never felt the need, actually, for, uh, for religion. I, I never do that, uh, you know, believing that you shall not kill, believing that you shall not steal. It's, I think we, most of us are born with that. You don't need someone to tell you and confirm that's the way you should behave. Uh, so, uh, when I came to this country, I was actually surprised by seeing so many religions and so many religious people and so many people who are think, taking advantage of the religious people for money and greed. So, today I would say I am an agnostic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, really, I don't need religion. I respect people who go to religion, who believe, and I believe that some people need it because you know, life is hard for some people, and if they have this thought that religion or God is giving them something, it's great, it's great. Now, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, and to me, that is no miracle. That when I see what religion has done to the world in the last 2,000 years, it's nothing to brag about it. And to this day, religion, to me, divides people when their job should be to bring people together. Yeah. I uh, participated uh, to a, uh, a christening of uh, the daughter of a friend. It must have been about uh, at least 10 years ago. And it is an evangelical, actually, uh, organization in uh, I think it's in, uh, near Santa Cruz, so on. And there must have been 2,000 people in that church. Well, that pastor started by saying, well, the Jews did not invent school. And I said, what a way to start a sermon. It's not true in the first place, but what a way. And I didn't want to say, I really say, I've got to say something. But they had goons all over the place that, sh that probably would have they would have punched me or thrown me out. I mean, this confirms my belief that I don't need religion. And I think a lot of people are using, actually, religion for power and for greed. Now, the Pope during the war, Pi 12, didn't do a thing for the Jews. He never spoke in favor of the Jews. He collaborated the... the uh, the Vatican was full of Gestapo and SS. He didn't lift a finger. And to me, Catholic, the Catholic religion. Although, I have to say, there were many priests at the lowest level who starved and who were deported because of them hiding and saving Jews. There were many Catholic uh, nuns who saved Jews. And they did wonderful, but at the top, it was power and greed, and nothing came from the top. So, yes. do I have any respect for these people? I believe that nothing must have changed, but I do believe very much in the people at the lower level, the people are really with the people. Yes. Those are good people. Those are good people. Yes. And they were very good people. And many of them paid their goodness with their lives. Okay. So, yes. when I see when, when I see people, and I believe actually that religion probably contributed to so many Jews being deported and killed and murdered because they went there and said, God will save me. Well, God did not yes. save them. Yes. The only way who could, they could be saved is themselves in believing in themselves instead of believing in a higher power. So when I, you know, when I do something when I want to achieve something, when I want to go up a mountain that I think is impossible with my bike, I say, well, God is going to help me. No, there's only one person going to help me, and it's going to be me. 
it is so interesting to hear your point of view because so many people I've interviewed, it, it, uh, it raised a question in my mind, how can some of the people say, I lived because I believe in God and God saved me. Others say, I don't believe in God. I lost my family, etc. My entire family. I was the only one that survived, and I survived because I believe in God. Oh, I find oh. it so strange well, that people would say. I that. think it's very selfish to think that way. No, what what is this person so good and so particular that only God would have would have chosen to save him while he killed his parents? and his family and his children and so on. I have a, a cousin who was three and a half years old. He was just a wonderful person. Charlot was his name. He was, he was taken and it is possible that he survived uh, the, the transport, probably not. But at three and a half years old, what was wrong that God would not protect him? while he protected us. I, know, I just cannot believe and it's, it's good that people believe in it. If they, they feel that way, it's fine. But, uh, but I certainly do not see it. I do not need it and I've never needed it and I'm very perfectly happy. I believe that you know, we, we are here on earth. It would be nice one day to find out how we all came to live, and that's why I'm an agnostic. I'm always open to discoveries. <laughs> I thank you so much for your opinion. I'm so sorry to be so. I'm so sorry to be so open with that subject. But that is very important. Well, it happens to be very important to me. Okay. In yeah. interviewing so many survivors to hear their different points of view. And I hope I, I did. I do thank you. I do not offend anyone who is going to to view this. I, I have